All right. Uh, good morning, everyone. We have the privilege of looking at the Torah for Parshat Bihar, the second to last, the penultimate Parsha of the book of Vayikra. Um, and the, the Haftorah actually comes from the book of Yirmiyahu, of Jeremiah, um, and uh, comes from the 32nd chapter, uh, verses 6 to 27. Um, and we'll, uh, we'll, you know, it's, it's, it's an interesting sort of uh, window into your Miyahu, um, which, which we'll have the opportunity to look at. Um, we rarely read this Haftorah. I didn't do the calculation exactly how rarely, but often the Har and Bikloktai are read together. And therefore we read Jeremiah 16 and 17, which is the Haftorah for next week, which we'll, we'll talk about uh, next, next time as well, um, next week uh, as well. Um, in general, we'll just make a, a comment about double Parshas. Then we'll dive in. In general, it's interesting in that um, uh, most of the partio that we read, they're, they're for the calendar cycle, right? We need to, we have this idea of finishing the Torah every year. That's a, 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 a newer practice, right? I mean, not, not that much newer, but that's a practice that wasn't always the case. Um, and so there are different things that we do because years have fewer or, or more Shabbatot to read Torah portions in, right? There are 54 Torah portions, there are 52 weeks, but there's always going to be Shabbat Cholomoid, a Shabbat of Shavuot, of Sukkot. Sometimes Rosh Hashanah will fall out on, you know, or, or, uh, or this or that, and therefore that will change the, the ebb and flow. So sometimes we need more, uh, uh, more uh, Shabbatot or less Parshiot, um, and so that's where we get the double Parshas. What's interesting is that the double Parshas, there are a bunch in Vayikra, Right, we could read Achrei Mo Kedoshim Tazri of Mitzorah Bahar Bechlotai. We can't read any double parshas in Brayshit. There are no double parshas possible in Brayshit. There are two possible in Shemot, right? Truma Tetzav and Vayaka Bakude. One, uh, one, I believe only one in, no, two in Bamidbar as well. Um, and one in Devar. So it, it's just interesting the way that breaks up, and we probably could talk about why that is. In general, when we read to, when we read Parshas together, um, there are overlapping themes, right? You think about the ones in, in Shemot, right? Truma Tetzava, Vayako Pekude, they're the same, you know, they're not the same, but they're the same theme, right? They're all talking about the construction of the Mishkan, right? We, uh, uh, Achrimo Kedoshim, right? The partio that we've read the last couple weeks, right? There's entire sections of Achrimo Kedoshim that are the same. Um, Mitzor, Tazria Mitzora, right? Those partio all deal with purity, impure, and impurity. And Tazria has as much of to do about the leper, about the Mitzora, Mitzora as partio of Mitzora does as well. So they sort of match together. By extension, right? Everything for us is going to come down to the Torah. By extension, if the Haftorah is supposed to have some connection to the Parsha, if you're reading two Parshiot that have similar messages, so the Haftorahs should be similar, right? And, and we sort of see that, right? We see that theme, that trend, right? The Haftorah for Truma Titzava is, you know, uh, very similar. Um, they're even like consecutive stories. Tazria Mitzora, consecutive stories. Um, uh, for our Parshiot, for Bahar and Bukhotzai, they're not consecutive stories, but they are in the same book, right? And there's, there's a certain interest, thing, there are certain connections, not just between this Haftorah and the Parsha, but be, between this Haftorah and next week's Haftorah as well, which we'll focus a little bit on next week when we look, we have the hindsight of looking at the last two Haftorah, right? So that's just an just a, a introduction. So our Haftorah obviously is uh, again on page eleven seventy seven in the R Scroll Stone Chumash, um, coming from Jeremiah. And as hopefully we well know now, Yirmiyahu is the uh, prophet of of the later prophets, um, and therefore we would expect this to be much more narrative, much more story. I'm sorry, much less story, much more prophetic prose than sort of narrative, but we do have a nice story here, sort of thrown in the middle of Jeremiah. Um, 
which obviously has a prophetic message. Yermiyahu as a whole, as a whole, um, is a prophet prophesizing when, what time? Approximately. The Babylonian time or some? At the very beginning of the Babylonian time, right before or at during and, and, and through the destruction of the first temple. Right, Jeremiah watches the waves of exile go. Um, there, are, there are four exiles of, uh, of, of the Babylonian exile um, up until the third exile, which is really the destruction of the temple and then the killing of Gedalia, the last governor where more people are exiled afterwards. But you also have the early waves of exiles of the leaders, right? Remember that's where Ezekiel, uh, uh, where, where uh, Yechezkel is exiled and that's why he's prophesizing from from beyond the borders of the land of Israel. Um, and so really, uh, Yermiyahu has that a very wide side. Um, and, you know, Yermiyahu is, you know, the, the book as a whole doesn't read with sort of a fluency from one to the other. But you'll be reading a story, it's a prophecy to one king, and then we're talking about another king 35 years later, and then an earlier king that's 10 years later. Right? There isn't a... a, 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 a uh, chronological flow to the book of Yermiao. Some of that's on purpose, right? Some of that is sort of Yermiao using the, the lack of, 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 of tempo in terms of uh, time as a way of sort of highlighting the fact of how difficult this was for him. Yermiao lived a tortured life as a prophet, right? He is attacked, mocked, thrown in jail, thrown in pits, ordered not to do things. So the order sort of matches that. Um, and our story sort of picks up exactly in that moment, right? I'm just going to read, we start in chapter six, I'm sorry, in verse six, I'm just going to read from you for you a little bit of the uh, chapter before where before our Torah starts, right? This is already later, Yermiel was sort of told people like things are over, right? It's going to be bad. The city's being conquered by Babel. Um, and he is... Uh, Hold on. We find ourselves in a subsection of Yermiao, chapter 30 through 34, which is Yermiao talking about what life will be like when the people return, right? Sort of a chapter of hope and optimism. Um, some of the some some of the the, the high points of Yermiao or the most uh, redemptive points of Yermiao um, is are in these chapters. Hazavar, so just this is chapter, this is verse one of this chapter. Um, what, what chapter are you on? 30 or 32? 32. 32. Okay. Um, This is the word that was spoke to Jeremiah, made Hashem from God, Bishnat or Bishana Asirit in the tenth year, with Sikiyahu Melech Yuda, Ki Hashana Hashmone, Asar Shana Lenivucha Netza. This is the tenth year for Sikiyahu, the king, and the eighteenth year of Nivucha Netza. Azhel Melech. Bavel Sarim al Yisrael Yushalayim. The army of the king of Bavel is uh, besieging Jerusalem. And Jeremiah the prophet, Haya Kalu Bechatzer Hamatara Asher Bebet Hamelech Yuda. Right? And Jeremiah is in a stockade, is in, a, uh, in jail. Right? Jeremiah has been thrown in jail. And we'll see who threw him in jail. Who threw him in jail? The king of Judah. The king of Judah said, "Stop! You are uh, a danger to society. Right? You okay. are going around telling everyone. Right? What's he saying? Let's just finish this. Okay. Right? Helen, the, the prophet, the verse has answered your question. Uh -huh. That Sidakaya, the king of Judah, confined him. Lay more saying, Madua Taniba." 
Lemor, why are you going around prophesizing the following message? So says the Lord, right? This is what Jeremiah says. Right? I'm giving over this land and the city to Bavel, and it will be captured. Give up. Surrender. Right? That's what Jeremiah's message is. At this point, Jeremiah has basically done a message of uh, that you should surrender, right? Chapter uh, chapter 24, he comes to this realization. He walks around Jerusalem carrying two baskets of figs, one beautiful, ripe, perfect figs, and then other bad, gaudy, I don't know what bad figs look like, but bad, mush figs, right? And he <laughs> says, these are two baskets. These are the Jewish people. The baskets of the good, ripe, good figs, those are the people who give in, who surrender to Bavel, and the bag of the figs, of the other figs, those are the people who fight against Bethel, right? Yermiyahu's message to them is, is, is a fascinating one, and really, we could spend time studying Yermiyahu. It's not in our not in our Haftar right now, but Yermiyahu's message is, give up to Bavel. Bavel is going to capture. God has deemed the Beit HaMikdash to be destroyed. If you give up to Bavel and you are subjugated, you will return. You won't be destroyed. You won't be killed. You will uh, come back and eventually tells them it's only going to be 70 years. But that was soon to be replaced themselves, and you'll you'll come back. Verse number four. Excuse, excuse me, Rabbi. I yes, hate sir. to interrupt, and I'm sorry I'm late, but could you tell me what page we're on? Of course. Never interruption, Leva. 1177 in the Stone Chumash. Okay, thank you. No problem. Well, I'm just going to finish the introduction. Right, basically, you Tzikiyahu is going to, uh, is not going to escape. He's going to get killed by, or he'll be delivered by the Bavel because he, uh, he, he, you know, basically, because they're not listening to God, right? That's essentially the background for this Haftorah. Uh, at that moment, right, there's a lot more, but at that moment, that's what the, the, the Torah is telling us, the Navi is telling us. Um, and basically it says, you cannot win against the uh, Babylonians. They will win. They will prevail don't fight them let them do let them do what they have to do um and uh and and that's what god wants you to do right so really interesting sort of counterintuitive beginning here right just give in trust god right which again is sort of against what we believe in what about like uh what about uh you know doing your hishtadlis doing your effort putting your best effort in sometimes right on a national level at least Right, God's giving a direct instruction not to do something, and that seems to be what happens here. We'll come back to this point. I think it's an important point, and also ties into our Torah. But we also understand with such devastating news, right? You don't want to read that in a half Torah that's supposed to perk people up and make them feel good. So we 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 sort of cut that out, right? Our Kodak moment begins after that, right? Vayomer, verse number six. Vayomer Yirmiyahu Hayah Devar Hashem Eli Leimor. Yirmiyahu said, "This is what God told me." Right? Where is Jeremiah? Jeremiah's in jail. What type of jail is this? Well, we'll see in a second, right? There are different commentaries whether this is like a maximum security jail or a low security jail. We'll see at this point, right? As we'll see, it seems like it's like a, well, we'll see. You'll, you just keep that question out in the back of your head. Hine, uh, uh, Hananel, Ben Shalom Dodecha Ba Elacha, your your cousin, the son of your uncle, is going to come. Lay more to tell you. Kenelacha et sede asher b'anatot. Buy my uh, field that is in Anatot. In the it, buy my field. Come purchase my field, right? Kilacha um, mishpat hagula liknot. Because you have the right, you have the opportunity, you have the obligation to redeem my field, right? What, what were we talking about here, right? This actually is one of the tie-ins to our Parsha. Our Parsha describes the laws of uh, redemption of land, land being sold, land uh, returning after the Yovel and the Shemitah, after the sabbatical and the Jubilee year. Um, and uh, we, have a, we have an idea, right, that in, in, in Jewish thought, and this is sort of the, the engine of the economic system in ancient Israel, is that everyone gets 
their lands, right? Everyone gets certain inheritance of their lands and they belong, it belongs to them. They can sell it. Let's say they need, you know, they have a shortfall, they need some money, they can sell it, but it's not permanent. Eventually it can come back. And to keep it in the family, the uh, family members can redeem it uh, along the way, right? Remember who's, who is, uh, who, 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 which story centers around uh, land being redeemed? I'll give you a hint. We're going to tell it on Shavuot. Root. Root, the story of Root, right? Boaz has to redeem it. It's, it's not exactly you have to marry the widow of the previous owner, but Boaz sort of concocts this plan that that's what happens, and therefore he's able to redeem the land, and uh, that's what happens, right? That's Geula. There's sort of, there's, there's, there's inheritance and there's redemption of the land. And that's, that's essentially what's happening here. Your uh, uh relative is telling him that. So the family has first right of refusal, basically. So, so there's a question about what exactly is happening here. The Ramban says, and he writes on our Parsha, that really anyone can buy it, right? And after anyone can buy it, so, let's say I get back money later on. I don't have to wait the 40 years. I have the right to buy back my land, right? And not only that, my relatives have the right to buy back my land. I, so can't, wouldn't that just mean like, oh, I need some money right now. I'll sell my land today, buy it back tomorrow when I, you know, make up the money. So it actually has to be, has to be, uh, to avoid that and to make people take it more seriously about buying their land, actually is sold for at least two years. But then, then this can happen. So it seemed the Rabban, all this is set up for the Rabban. Rabban suggests that maybe there was a process, right, that might be here, that at least the custom was, if you're going to have the right to buy the land anyways, why don't I just go to you directly as my relative and say, instead of let's cut out the middleman, instead of cutting out the potential buyer, why don't you just buy it? You redeem it from me directly, uh, and we'll, be, we'll, we'll keep it in the family, right? And that's essentially what seems to be happening. Okay. Um, now, should Jeremiah buy the land? Jeremiah's been telling everyone the temple's going to be destroyed. The Jews are going to be exiled. Give in to Bavel. Is that a great time to buy a lakeside property in Jerusalem? Right. No. And, and, he can, and he can do this from jail. He has that. Oh, so that's fascinating, right? Seems like, it seems like, that's why I was saying, what type of jail is he in? Right? It seems like he can. Not only that, you'll see he does buy it. And he has a scribe come and witnesses come and they count out the money. Like it's a whole process. So it's clear he's not in a maximum. He's not in Guantanamo Bay, right? He's not. Uh, he's an but, artist, though. Yeah, he's not in. I mean, even so, I would say, so we'll, we'll come to that in a moment, but he's, in a, he's a political prisoner. He's on house arrest, right? He's in jail, not because he did something wrong, but because he has certain political, he's a, a, uh, an anarchist, or he's you know undermining the political rule. He's a political prisoner. He's also a very important person, and therefore you know they didn't just just stick him in a pit somewhere in the Dead Sea, right? Uh, you know, a, a one way ticket to Engedi. No, they didn't do that. So, um, verse number eight. Then Dodi Asher Banatot Veshkolo Atakesef. Shiva Shkalim Vasara Hakasa, right? Um, so I'm gonna buy it uh, way out from him the silver, seven, seven shkalim and ten uh uh kasef. The Achtov, verse number 10, Basefer, and we're gonna sign a deed, we're gonna write out a formal document, the Achtom, and I will sign and seal it. And we're going to appoint witnesses. Um, and we're going to do a whole public, you know, he makes this into a whole public idea, right? This is one of the models of prophecy. We'll see some of these coming up in some of the but Yermiyahu was, had a flair for dramatics sometimes, right? He did an action. Why is God commanding him to do this? Because God's give a message. And this whole action is a metaphor for that, right? The figs, carrying these baskets of figs, walking, he's, you know, he's using the art of theater to convey a message of his, of his prophecy. 
be like, how can I see for how make them to take the 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 bill of sale, the proof, my star, my document that proves that I own this, the hechatum, um, it's uh, and everything, all of the all of the different pieces, and I'm gonna give it to uh, El Baruch Benaria. I'm gonna give it to my trusty scribe and assistant Baruch Benaria. Lene before everyone, before all the witnesses, before everyone, before Kol Yosh Kol Hayudim Hayushvim Bechatzer Amatara. Everyone who's in this like uh, political detention center, all the dissenters are going to watch this. Kol Amar Hashem, so says God, the God of Israel. By the Koach Etasvarim, take this uh, document um, and all the bill of sale and everything with it. And put them in a klicharis, put them in an earthenware jar, leman yamdu yamim rabim, so that they would stand for many days. Meaning, Jeremiah's message isn't that exile isn't happening now, right? Property values are about to go up. Jeremiah's message is don't lose hope in the final redemption. Meaning, buy the property now, but roll it up, put it in an earthenware container, because it will last for a very, very long time. Right? His goal here is to strengthen the belief of the people that they will be able to return, that they, if they give into the Babylonians, if they listen to God through this process, they will not be lost. Right? And that we've talked about over and over again is part of the major message of the prophets to the Jews facing the first exile, because that's never happened before, right? This is not what they believed is supposed to happen. Judaism was never an exile religion until this moment. And all of a sudden, it will be, and there, he is preparing the Jewish people for that. Um, um, and that, that's, that's exactly what happens, right? How long can something last in an earthenware, an earthenware jug? For a really long time, right? Anyone ever hear of the Dead Sea Scrolls? Right. Right? right. 2,000 2, years they sat in those jugs. If you had the right climate. That's part of it. This is, Anatote is in that area, right? Anatote is, uh, there used to be an airport in Anatote, right? It got closed down, um, and Ben Gurion is the main airport, but Anatote is a suburb of Jerusalem. Sort of in that area. I might be the right part. Marlene, you had a question? Oh, no, no. No so, question. And, and, and part of this message is sort of to instill hope in the people, right? If Jeremiah's message or if Jeremiah's goal in, 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 in all of his prophecies is to get the people to repent and to save them from impending destruction, he was an abject failure as a prophet. But that's not his goal. His goal is to train and teach his Jewish people to instill them a hope in that they will return and b therefore that means as they go into exile how to be a nation in exile, right? Jeremiah teaches them pray for the people where you're exiled into. Right? We do that every day and every week when we dominate for America, right? Jeremiah was the one who established that, right? Even the Babylonians who are exiling you. Right, Davin for their success, because their success will be your success. Right? That's part of the message here that Jeremiah leaves. Let's take a step back for a second and just talk about the Parsha. Right. So how does this tie into our Parsha? Right. What is this? What's the connection to our Parsha? So part of the what is Bahar all about? So Bahar has a, a number, a couple of themes. So let's we'll, we'll run them down quickly, and then we'll come back into our into our connection. So Bahar primarily begins. It really talks about these laws of Geula, of redemption of the land, and the Shemitah and the Yovel, the Jubilee and sabbatical year. Right, right now is the Shemitah year. Right. What is um, Um, what so what whenever someone talks about Shemitah, right? What uh 
what's the most obvious question that you have to ask yourself, right? I tell you, don't plant and plow for a year and maybe even two years, right? What, what, what are you going to eat? What are you going to do? What's your question? How am I going to eat, right? How am I going to eat, right? And what's interesting is for the Torah asks that question directly, right? That's in our Parsha. On page 700, if you have a stone chumash, but if not, I'll just read it. And if you want to ask, what am I going to eat in the seventh year? We're not going to plant and, and reap the, the, our crops. And I'll give you enough food to eat um, and you'll, you'll manage all the way through the eighth year, right? Because your, your grain won't come in until the end of the eighth year. So you're not the sixth year harvest now have to carry you for the sixth year, the seventh year, and then until the eighth year harvest comes in. It's really three years. What's the message? What are we telling the people? We're telling them trust God, right? But not just trust God. We always say trust God. Where the message to the people is trust God and be and submit to Shemitah, right? Be passive, right? Shemitah is this requirement for us. There's so many messages that Shemitah instills in us. But one of them is to be passive, recognize that we don't control everything, right? That, that, that there, you know, we have to put our trust and our faith in God and that God will protect us either way, but we can't do anything about it, right? Normally, it's, it's a very counterintuitive notion and it's a balance we need to have recognizing what areas where our efforts we can do something and what areas do we need to be passive about because we just can't, right? And there are times when that's what we're called on to do. And we're told in those moments, we will receive God's protection, right? We'll receive God's blessing. Yermiel is essentially describing the same thing, giving hope to the people, right? That they will be able to uh, overcome, right? He's not saying give into Bavel and be wiped out. And he's also, this is the best metaphor um, of, how that hope is going to manifest. I'm going to buy land now, even though I'm in jail, and I know we're going to we're going to be exiled and sent out of the land because in 70 years we'll be back, and I'm going to plant this seed in a way, literally in earthenware jugs, so it stays uh, stays around. So then, 70 years, my family can claim back that land. It's a very a very interesting sort of message of hope, of hope reliance on God. But hope nonetheless. Um, Wait, I I do have a question. Sure. Um, uh, so, is there any of this ever used in uh, contemporary Israel when they have these things about uh, they had some property in East Jerusalem, for instance, and uh, they bought it uh, seventy years ago, and they have a document and. So is any of this uh, referred to ever as a, uh, something that justifies, uh, I, I you know, just wondered if they connected in some way. There's definitely, this is, I, I don't think it's unique. So I think the answer is yes, but I don't think it's because of this. I think it's, you know, sort of standard business practice. If I can prove that I own something, then I own something. Right. Um, especially as new countries come in, there's a certain understanding that, the governments have the opportunity to sort of decide, are they, you know, resetting the system or allowing previous ownership to continue, which I believe, right. you know, has allowed, and previously the Brits allowed, and before that the Ottomans allowed. So it, once you're recognizing past systems, that's just the legal, moral, right way to do it. I think this is proof text that even within Judaism, that's the right idea. But yeah. I, I don't know if they're particularly pointing to this, or that's just what business is, right? Right. You yeah. know, so, but yeah, you, but the parallel to today is not, is not, uh, is not lost. It should not be lost on any of us, right? People who invested because they felt like it was the right time. And even if they didn't reap the benefit, right, we're at the end of that, right? We have the end of that cycle where we have to then go and tell the Jewish, we have to go back and be what Jeremiah is telling the people at the end you should do, right? Be there, go back, be, be part of the solution, be part of the gula, the redemption. Um, 
Jeremy, I was talking about the first part of it. We we're talking, you were talking about the end, the later part, but for sure that's definitely encapsulated in his statement as well. Okay, thank you. Um, I think it's, it's also so interesting just to lay out like how this, how transaction worked. There were witnesses and they signed and they sealed, right? This is like how one would do a business transaction today and how halakha scripts business actions today. Um, and that's what he does. And he instructs, he instructs his, uh, you know, Baruch Benaria to do that. And he takes it and they heal, they hide it. And he basically tells everyone, Koamar Hashem, verse uh, 15, Koamar Hashem Svako, okay, Israel, so declares God, master of the legions, the God of Israel. Oh, Yikna, oh, uh, you, more, more, you should again, you should continue, excuse me, to buy houses and fields and vineyards in this land, right? That's the message. The message is have hope that even though in the short term things look bleak and you're gonna be exiled, the future is bright, right? Continue to invest, buy your property now speculatively because in the future, it's just gonna go up and up and up, right? That's what that's what Yirmi was sort of saying over here. Great business opportunity. Um, there's a whole second section of this Haftorah where your meow then breaks off into a prayer to God, but it's a whole other involved unit, and we'll save it for next year if you get into it. It's another one I, I was, we were going to talk about it, but I think it's going to take us for too long to do that. So we'll, we'll stop here. If there, anyone has any questions, we'll, we'll, we'll take them. Next year, we're going to focus on the second part of this Haftorah, where your meow sort of transitions into a prayer that Halel al Hashem, Acharei Titi et Sefer Mikne El Barach Benari Alemor. I prayed to God after I did this whole thing and I made this whole process and I gave Barach Benari the instruction. And I realized your is still in jail. He's sitting there in jail. And uh, basically, I, you know, at a certain point, he turns to God and goes, God, you promised me I wouldn't get hurt, right? Here I am. You protect me, right? I didn't want this job, right? I, want, I didn't want to be a prophet. I wanted, uh, and you said, don't worry, I'll be with you. And here I am in jail, right, in the stockade. How can I, uh, well, you know, why were you protecting me? Now, the truth is, God didn't say that it wouldn't be hard for him. God just said they wouldn't kill him, right? And they don't kill him. Um, God never said this was going to be easy for them. But that's a, a separate issue that we'll, we'll deal with Jeremiah. All right, so we'll stop here. Um, it's good to see everyone. Have a wonderful week. Happy almost yeah. live, Bomer. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Rabbi. My pleasure. Thank you. Today's the 32nd Omer, which is perfect for the 32nd chapter of Jeremiah that we just studied. And uh, I wish everyone have a great, great day. Okay, you Thank too. You. Bye. Bye.